you've transcended a liminal threshold into history fuzz, a realm of contemplative inquiry in which leading researchers discuss the motivations, tools and skills of the sky watchers, surveyors, architects and builders who delineated monumental landscapes with awe-inspiring structures enshrining their diverse cosmic chronicles in stone. I'm your host, Ashley Cowie. You can unlock videos, maps, articles, and enjoy early ad-free new episodes by becoming a member on HistoryFuzz.com, where you can also apply to join our team exploring and filming archaeology documentaries in the Andean highlands of Colombia. This cosmomythologically charged episode features Professor Giulio Magli, an Italian astrophysicist and archaeoastronomer serving as the head of the Department of Mathematics at the Polytechnic University of Milan, where he teaches Italy's first official course in archaeoastronomy. With a background in relativistic astrophysics, for 25 years Giulio has applied mathematics to the orientations and alignments of ancient buildings, revealing connections between the sky architecture, religion, and mythology. We begin with discussing the underlying archaeoastronomical alignments within Cambodia's Angkor Wat, the largest religious complex ever built, and Julio explains the fine lines between intentionality and chance, sharing his distaste for numerology, demonstrating the selection effect. Contravening many previous claims, Julio explains why the pyramids of Egypt have nothing whatsoever to do with the Orion constellation. Join me in this non-linear, labyrinthian discussion with Professor Julio Magli. By the way, I've, I have seen your papers on Angor. And I am very intrigued by the proposed role of the second hill, uh, besides uh, Prombok. It's, it's, it's interesting. I want to think about that. Well, Giulio, while I published my findings eight years ago, I'm still convinced the temples on Nombok and Nomdai Hill do indeed represent the earliest state meridian in the Angkor region. Yes. They're both built by the same ruler, which gives my theory the dynastic heritage that you demand. The hill is a very, very important For instance, when you float in the beret, the only thing you see at the horizon is this, this hill. So maybe... The position of Angkor Wat was perhaps determined because of the summer solstice sunrise behind the Nombok Hill Temple. Do you think that's perhaps the case, or do you argue that? I can uh, believe it when I see it, because uh, I'm not sure that you can actually see the uh, sun rising behind the, the hill from inside the uh, precinct of the temple. Mm. That's the point. I don't re- actually. I don't remember if you from the inside you can see the Plombok hill. I suggest it's the western gate. But maybe just from the front of the west entrance that you can see the hill. And um, uh, another thing. I, by myself, discovered one temple, this was later than uh, publishing my paper on Angkor, which is precisely oriented to summer solstice sunrise. Mm. So uh, this this is a temple, it's not far from Angkor Wat, it's a a secondary temple. I was not aware of it when I discovered just on, on satellite imagery, but it is there. And this should be studied because, first of all, it shows the interest from the sum, for the summer solstice with the axis of a temple, which is quite unusual in Angkor. And the second, I would like to understand to which deity it was devoted and all of that. Anyway, it is there. I can send you a, a Google Earth place mark for this temple. Uh, it's very clearly oriented to the summer solstice. And of course, there is another point, which is the Im- impressive alignment, uh, which is an alignment. Uh, it is a topographical one with the 
Ryakan temple. This is so surprising that I don't think it is, it is a chance. I don't think. Could you describe that alignment? Uh, it is almost 100 kilometers on the, on the parallel, due east of uh, Angkor Wat. You just go uh, due east of Angkor Wat, you hit the entrance to Priyakkan or, Com- or Compos Y. It's very impressive. How can that be so? How would one measure such an alignment? If you move on the parallel or on the meridian, it is more acceptable. Mm. If you are going on the parallel, so, so due east, or are going to the meridian, so uh, due north, uh, it's uh, easier to conceive that, that they can be intended also if they cannot be seen. Uh, a famous example is the Chaco Meridian. Maybe you you are aware of it. Yes, yes. The Anasazi were likely moving uh, on the meridian, founding new places, uh, to first to the north, uh, then to the south of Chaco. When we're finished here, Julio, I'm going to ask you for a contact regarding the Chaco Meridian. I'd love to do an episode and discover exactly what that alignment represents in the American Southwest. Okay. But for now, let's jump over to Egypt for a moment. In your research, you placed a great importance on the horizon within ancient location determination. Are you speaking about the uh, technical role or symbolic role? I want you to tell us the the technical role relating to measurement and practical archaeoastronomy. Oh, okay. And why that might have been expressed, perhaps stepping into more symbolic or conceptual realms. The local horizon of an observer is a fundamental concept of archaeoastronomy because you can have a, a theoretical position of the, uh, say, the rising of the sun. And today you can extract this data from any planetarium software. So once upon a time, it was necessary to make a lot of calculation, but now you can have it in real time from any planetarium software. But uh, this is only theoretical uh, theoretical value. Mm. Because if you have, for instance, a hill at the horizon, then it will delay the rising of the sun and while uh, it is delaying it is also increasing the azimuth because the sun is is rising to a greater altitude Mm -hmm. so when you measure any kind of uh, alignment in archaeoastronomy you must measure both the azimuth and eight in degrees of the horizon to understand which is the place on the horizon where you will uh, see the uh, celestial body actually rising. Mm -hmm. And the same, of course, holds for the setting. So if uh, the horizon delays rising, if you make uh, just a drawing, you will see it immediately. And if you have a hill, setting will be earlier. So the azimuth will be decreased in this case. This is the role of the Horizon, as they say, the second coordinate you need in arc astronomy, you just need, fortunately, you just need two coordinates because you, you know, you see the uh, celestial, celestial sphere with the stars and the celestial bodies on the surface of the celestial sphere. So you don't need a third dimension, uh, which could tell you, for instance, if stars are closer or, or not. Uh, but these two are equally fundamental. Yes. And the horizon has a symbolic meaning in the sense that what happens at the horizon has been of great interest for so many cultures. Mm -hmm. For instance, at the horizon, iliacal phenomena uh, occur. Iliacal phenomena is a a sort of technical term, but it, it is easy to understand when you have a star which rises and sets during the year, it will go in conjunction with the sun. So heliacal phenomena are uh, easy to understand. If you have a star which is rising and setting during the year, the star will go in conjunction with the sun. So the star is visible, but it's not actually visible because it is out, say, so to say, it's out in the sky together with the sun. When this period of invisibility ends, you will see the star rising a few minutes, also a few seconds, if it, if it is a, 
high magnitude, uh, low magnitude star uh, before the sun. Mm. So at your right zone, you can see uh, the star you are searching for. You want the star to come back in the sky just before the sun at your right zone. The, of course, the, perhaps the most famous example is Ilya Kal uh, Retarn of Sirius in the Egyptian uh, sky, which was strongly connected with the way uh, the Egyptians were uh, measuring time since the first dynasties, I am speaking at the beginning of the third millennium BC. So it was connected to the calendar and it was also connected with the symbolic word of the Egyptians because Sirius was uh, the celestial counterpart of Isis, the sister of Osiris and the uh, responsible for the coming back to life of uh, Osiris. I currently am studying the alignments present within Moisca, Colombia. The holy roads, the long distance alignments that connected the temples are based within creation mythology and the coming of the god Bochica who used a staff to make a waterfall in southern Colombia and from there most of the major temples have significant alignments. Do you find in Egypt and in Cambodia the same is the case? While archaeoastronomy is present, the alignments are often sourced in mythology. Yes, in, in, in Egypt, you can say that the most striking alignment is not an astronomical alignment in a sense, and it is uh, related to the cosmological myth uh, of Egypt, because the uh, we are speaking of the old kingdom. So we are, uh, let's say, in the uh, middle of the third millennium BC, between 2007 uh, and 2300 BC. And the cosmological myth was uh, relating to a place. This place was the temple of Heliopolis, mm. located on the eastern side of the Nile, on the eastern bank of the Nile, so today it, it is not far from the Materia zone of Cairo mm -hmm. and very little remains of this temple because it, it was looted during the millennia. The uh, obelisk, which is today located in front of the Italian parliament in Montecitorio Square in Rome, comes from Heliopolis, just to say one thing. But we are sure uh, that it was there because there is a standing obelisk still there and there is a line which can be traced between the southeast corners of the Giza pyramids. So you start from the southeast corner of Menkaura and you cross essentially the southeast corner of Kafra and of Khufu pyramid. And from there, you see that this line is uh, actually a 45 degree line. So it is uh, what is usually called a uh, northeast line. And uh, you go and go. And of course, today you can't see anything because the, you have the uh, buildings, you have the uh, pollution of Cairo. But in ancient times, you, can, you could actually see uh, the Temple of Heliopolis, which is located many kilometers far. Mm. And maybe person with a person could not communicate because it is too far. But once you have a pyramid, which is, say, uh, 40 or 50 meters of height, so you are constructing the pyramid yet, uh, you already can see Heliopolis. And of course, from Heliopolis, you will see the pyramids. And what is very nice is that, that there are uh, photographs which were taken in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century. Pollution in Cairo was still low. And you see the Giza pyramids, which essentially are uh, like... Uh, small things at your horizon which tend to align one after the other to Heliopolis. Mm -hmm. But why? Because the pharaohs were directly descending from the god Ra, and the god Ra was uh, residing, say, in, uh, in Heliopolis. And so this is, uh, in a sense, this is really a... Mythological alignment. Yeah, it, it's... Uh, relating to cosmology and to cosmological mythology.
let me share this story with you. This is wonderful. So a highly respected archaeoastronomer in Colombia, his name is Professor Juan David Morales. He wrote a paper in 1989 about Buchica, the creation myth I told you about. And what he discovered was that if you plotted the central temple of the sun in Bogota and you drew a 45 degree alignment, 169 kilometers to the northeast, that it located the secondary temple of the sun between which myths say Buchica traveled and it's known as the road of Buchica. Dr. Morales calculated that at the latitude of Bogota, that represents one degree of latitude. Have you questioned how long the similarly derived mythological alignment in Egypt is? Do you have length on that? I do not believe in this kind of... Uh, uh-huh. uh, <laughs> I do not believe <laughs> that, uh, I don't believe uh, at all in this kind of things for uh, basing on my experience uh, 25 years. You get to a line in any measurement where some people skip over that line and bring beliefs and assumptions and imagination in. Where does that line exist for you? Why don't you believe in numerology? There are a lot of reasons why I do not believe in numerology at all. There is a technical reason, uh, which is very strong, but we'll tell you this later. Mm -hmm. Because the most important reason is cognitive. I was saying I have 25 years of experience on the field. Uh, I've been working in, in so many places around the world. And I always, always seen that what the ancient powers wanted to show was explicit. Mm. I always seen that. Um, The messages of ancient architecture can be really complicated, horribly complicated for us to understand, for us to understand. But they were always explicit. Inserting numbers in exoteric way into architecture is a thing which I have never seen in, in all my experience. I always seen message, maybe complicated messages, but here we are. I want to show you my power, my connection with the celestial cycles, mm. my connection with the, um, say, power of a place or of a river or whatever, but explicit. So uh, I have not even one example of applied uh, numerology. For instance, you can start from the most simple uh, numerology. The Maybe the most simple number, which is not two, is three. Okay? So let's start from the number three. There are three pyramids in Giza, and there is a very famous connection with three stars, which are the three stars of the belt of Orion. Yes. So this is not archaeoastronomy because there is no alignment. Uh, you just say, oh, there are three places on the, uh, on the Giza Plateau and three stars on the, on the sky. If you say this for any other place in the world where you do not have any cultural connection of the builders of the, of the pyramids with the stars of Orion, I would say, don't even think about that. Mm-hmm. But I have been thinking about that many times uh, because... Uh, Orion was an image of Osiris. So, in principle, it is possible that this connection would be there. But finally, I had the occasion of crossing a wall night uh, inside the Giza Plateau in the full dark, besides the Cairo lights at the horizon, uh, because we were filming a a program during the night. Mm. So, I've been there. Uh, in, in, with any condition of light, including full night. And in particular, I've been in Menkaura, close to Menkaura Pyramid, uh, in, on many occasions. And I can tell you that you will never think to the stars of Orion. You will always think, oh, let's see, these three things are aligned to Heliopolis. Aha. Uh-huh. This is the message. The message is these three things are aligned to the Heliopolis. This is why Menkaura, which is smaller, was shifted with respect to a line connecting the three uh, centers of the pyramids. That's why Orion connection has been uh, formulated. 
So I, I made this example because the, it is a, it is an example which has a sound environment. The fact that the Egyptians were interested in Osiris, I don't believe that in this numerology, but it is a sound example. Then you can go how far as as you want. I mean, for instance, you can try to count the stones in Stonehenge and say that it is a Julian calendar as it happened two years ago and we published a relatively strong paper to, to destroy this, debunk this idea. But this is not sound because uh, it, uh, you are connecting the people who built Stonehenge 2,400 uh, or so years BC with an idea which is Roman because the, <laughs> the Julian calendar was introduced uh, by Caesar and, and uh, adjusted by Augustus 2,400 years later. So there is no cognitive aspect, there is no cultural aspect which is uh, sound in all these cases. There is perhaps one cultural aspect, and it's pop cultural. Yeah, yeah, yes. Because the Orion alignment within the pyramids originated in the 60s. The Stonehenge calendar assumption was made by Gerald Hawkins in the 60s in England. And since then, the last 60 years have been greatly pervaded by pop cultural theories that build on misinterpreted coincidences. Doesn't it frustrate you as a researcher that so many people can tell you about alignments with Orion and the pyramids, but nobody really appreciates the importance of the connection with Heliopolis? Does that not frustrate you that the reality has been masked by so much pop culture? Uh, okay, but, uh, you know, I'm a scientist. Uh, in my background is in astrophysics. And uh, when I was working in astrophysics, uh, I have seen so many crazy theories, and uh, so you get used to that. Try to to give the correct information to people, uh, as much people as you can, and that's fine, I mean. Yeah. Going back to Cambodia, I think an example that led me astray, and it really did lead me astray, so much so that I have to go and revise those articles that I published. Eleanor Manick yeah. in her 2001 paper, Time, Space and Astronomy in Angkor Wat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This brings us to the se to my second point, because we were still speaking about my first point, which is against numerology, which is the cultural point. But I have also a technical point, very strong. It has a name. This name is selection effect. Mm. The selection effect is towering over arc astronomy since the birth of arc astronomy. What is selection effect? It's the fact that you have a variety of uh, data and you, I mean, not you, you in the... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and tend to select the data which fits your theory. This has been done so many times. For instance, uh, uh, if you have... Uh, uh, Flat land with uh, with huge stones placed everywhere, and you measure the alignments between two or, uh, if you are fortunate, three stones, and then you select those alignments which fits the astronomy you want to be there. Mm. Uh, in the case of numerology, this is I mean this is clamorous I mean because uh, you measure a temple Angkor Wat and. Let's hope that she did uh, it in a perfect way, uh, not speaking, not criticizing her in this case, but just because the methods uh, were not uh, those we have today. Today we have lesser scanners, which can be can, can go to an accuracy of the millimeter. I mean, uh, but at those times it was not so. But anyway, if we assume that all these measures are correct, then first we have to assume a unit of measure. And second, we have to do statistics with all the measures to assure that you are not doing selection effect. For instance, there is a, a, a famous statement, which is, to me is just crazy. I mean, just really crazy uh, that you have the length of the year in days by adding two sides of the precinct of Angor. Why are you adding two sides and not taking the diagonal, for instance? Mm. I prefer the diagonal rather than adding two sides and so on. You can take the diagonal of the main room 
or the sides of the main room, why are you not taking the eight of the tower? And so on, and so on, and so on. So if you approach this data in a correct way, which means you take on all the data and you search for a, a correlation factor with your hypothesis, you will find that the correlation is not there. Uh, so this is a technical point, which is very clear. Finally, in all this, you have to choose a unit of measure. And again, uh, in my experience, I can say that the use of a globalized unit of measure was very rare. What you can have and you must have is that you use the same unit of measure in the same building. Mm -hmm. Because you start building and you go to your workers and you say, this is the unit measure. So typically, uh, you cannot take a unit measure that you say, this is, this is the one used by the Romans, for instance, and measure a building with great accuracy because you will not find it. Even for the Roman, Roman foot, we can be sure up to the centimeter. When we go to the millimeter, we are not so sure that it was standardized. So for the Romans, I'm speaking. Mm -hmm. So for instance, for the Khmer, there are many measures made by the French group and they found a high variability of the so-called Khmer qubit when you change the import. But I repeat, the, for me, the most important reason is the cognitive one, the cultural one. This kind of numerology should be discarded. This kind of numerology should be discarded. Yes, indeed, Giulio. And it was Eleanor's suggestions that the measurements within the main precinct had great cosmological significance in their numerology. That means, as I said, I have to readdress these papers before I publish them with this episode because that was a really misleading piece of work and it was published through a major US university, but it really should be revised because wasted a lot of my time. Similarly to the megalithic yard in the Northern Hemisphere, that Professor Tom suggested in the 1960s, and he measured over 600 standing stones, burial cairns, and stone settings, and then he pulled an average. Yeah. But averages don't exist when people are measuring out standing stone settings, and I think the variances he noted at each site from his megalithic yard were the differences in the length, perhaps, of the ruler's forearms or shin lengths, or feet. Yes, Tom's work is very important because uh, before before Tom, people was even thinking that in the megalithic times they were not using a, a, a measure, thing, which is which is crazy. I mean, they they were wonderful engineers. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, if you uh, measure Woodenge, which is the uh, remain of this wooden version of, of Stonehenge near uh, Dunnington Walls. Yes, yes. There you can you can actually see the use of a unit measure. But thinking that there was a standardized measure, a, a bureau of standards of the megalithic time, is, is just crazy. Yeah, indeed, Professor Tom, he skipped the scientific light fandango because if his megalithic yard truly existed... Well, that opens door to, I quote Ewan Mackay from Glasgow University, that there was perhaps um, some form of priestly, astronomer, magician, agriculturalist class of people in control of the Neolithic North. But of course, that's completely unfounded and only supported by those that assume a megalithic yard existed, a standard unit, a building module. And it just didn't. What happened was, Tom, as great as he was, and as inspired as he became, just put his foot one pace too far over the woo line. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is all my life. I mean, it, it's so many years that I try to uh, give uh, the correct weight to the ability of our ancients without adding to them things which are modern. Eight years ago, I published a book. The book was called A Twist in Time. By 3000 BC, all over the world, 
cultures involved in deriving astronomical measurements and building orientations to suit had achieved to within about a degree of accuracy in their architecture. Mm -hmm. Axiomatically, so too must the ropes have been calibrated to within about a degree of accuracy. And what I did was I interpreted all of the tools from Scarabri in the Orkney um, Neolithic culture. Yeah. I took tools that Professor Gordon Child in the 60s said were probably ceremonial or ritual. And I have quite clearly discovered that several of them were for rope calibration. Yeah. The mysterious resins that were found in pots probably weren't ritual potions, but I think they were waxes and resins. Because here's the thing, Professor um, Magley, correct me if I'm wrong. A rope can stretch and shrink by four or five degrees on any given day, depending on humidity yeah. and the strength of the person pulling the rope. And a knot can swell in the morning and shrink in the afternoon. So I think underneath these measurements lies an exceptionally well-developed set of rope production and calibration codes. Mm -hmm. And of course, there wasn't a standard council of units and measures, but I think there was quite advanced methods of maintaining calibrated measuring tools. Okay, I will, I will, if you, you can send it to me, I will read it with pleasure. Mm. Uh, yes, the um, I tend to think that uh, ancient accuracy was the product of a series of different knowledge. Of course, one of them was astronomy, of course. Another one was the uh, ability of producing instruments, in particular ropes. Mm -hmm. And another one was geometry. Use of a standardized unit was essential in any workplace. So you can have the workplace of just a hut, or you can have the workplace of the Khufu pyramid in Giza, which lasted, say, 25, 26 years. Mm -hmm. So in my view, you have to, to use uh, some geometry. And the way the Egyptians were using geometry was very, very clever because they were using Pythagorean triangles. Pythagorean triangle uh, means that you have uh, integer numbers in the three legs of the triangle. Mm. Uh, the standard one is three, four, five, which is precisely the slope of the Kafra pyramid. Of course, with no geometric discrimination placed towards the 6, 8, 10, or the 15, 20, 25. When you use these <laughs> triangles, you don't need uh, a unit of measure continuously. Because you just say to, for instance, if you want to, to cut the stones uh, which will be put on the exterior of the pyramid, mm -hmm. you just say to the person in charge of the cut, just cut three, four, five. Mm. And they will use any measure and they will do it correctly anyway if they use the these numbers. What I would like to do now is leave Cambodia, Neolithic, um, Scotland and Egypt. And I'd like to ask you about your research suggesting Machu Picchu, as is commonly believed, was not a royal estate. You have a different proposition and I'd like you to jump over to another continent and discuss with the audience your findings at Machu Picchu. Uh, okay, okay. Um, so let us recall that the standard view of archaeology about Machu Picchu is that each Inca ruler was the owner of a sort of royal estate. Mm. They even made a connection with Camp David, to make an example. So each Inca ruler had its own Camp David. And these Camp Davids were located on the Urubamba Valley, which is the river valley which goes northeast from Cusco. Yes. So each one of them was, of the, uh, was a royal estate, and Machu Picchu was the royal estate of Pachacuti Inca, very important. Uh, Inca ruler. Mm. But if you visit Machu Picchu, you see that it was planted each single stone. Machu Picchu was 
a cliff, a rough cliff covered by huge boulders of stones. Mm -hmm. And they planned each angle of this place. For instance, they decided which kind of, which boulders of stone would have been retained in the construction because they imagined a construction related to the stones. One example is the so-called Torreon. Torreon, of, of course, is a Spanish name, which is this sort of circular tower which contains a, a huaca, a sacred stone. So uh, they planted this in every single place of Machu Picchu. Uh, they left, for instance, a huge boulder because they wanted to sculpt it with the profile of the uh, mountains below, mm. uh, so-called sacred stone of Machu Picchu, and so on. So really, we must think that this place was a place of leisure of the Inca. To me, it is at least doubtful. Second, it, in principle, the Inca is supposed to go there in winter. But although Cusco is 3,500 years altitude, it is in the tropical zone. The winter is not so cold. And Machu Picchu is not so friendly, so, such a friendly place. Uh, because it's full of mosquitoes. And so it's, it's not so a nice place. And it is. Uh, it takes uh, you at least two days and a half to go for, uh, to, from Cusco to Machu Picchu following the Urubamba uh, River. If you follow the so-called Inca Trail, it will take more. Yes. It takes more. But the Inca was traveling along the Urubamba about two days. So it's not so close. Yes. Finally... It is plenty of sacred places, and it is a directional place. This is my, uh, my uh, main point. It is directional. If you uh, look at the map of Machu Picchu, usually it has not the north on top, because it is rotated with respect to north. But if you restore the north, then you will see that, uh, that Machu Picchu was enjoyed in the following way. People was reaching a quite huge esplanade outside the town, from where you can see the town. Mm -hmm. If you are admitted into the town, you must cross the, the door. Then you will uh, first reach a place which is somewhat rough. It, it looks like a quarry, but it's not a quarry. It, it is just a representation of Pachamama, the, the, uh, the mother goddess. The mother goddess. And then you reach the main uh, square. On the right, you have the Inca quarters. Of course, the Inca ruler was going to Machu Picchu. I'm not saying he was not going. I'm saying he was not going to treat uh, state affairs or relax, but he was going there. And you have a, a, a sort of pyramid. Yes. Uh, this pyramid has, um, on the basis, a huge temple with three windows. Then you go up and... On the uh, uppermost point, you have a waka, a stone waka. So three windows, a hill, and a stone waka. Yeah. The cosmological myth of the Incas speaks of this place because the Incas were coming from the uh, southeast of Cusco. There was a place called Tambo Toco. Is this the legend of the Ayur brothers? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes, they came out from a place with three windows. So you're suggesting that when pilgrims arrive at Machu Picchu from Lake Titicaca, that they experience a three-dimensional walkthrough of their creation mythology. Exactly, exactly. I think that Machu Picchu was uh, uh, like so many places of processional places in the world, a replica. It was a replica. Mm. It was a replica of the most sacred place of the Incas, the uh, cosmological place of the Incas. To me, it was a replica. And it has the same structure of the Island of the Sun, which is the place where the uh, sun was born. Mm -hmm. Also there, there is a huge place where, from where you can see what happens in the uh, sacred plaza. And if you are admitted to the sacred place, you can go to the Rock of the Sun. But I think that very few people were admitted inside Machu Picchu. Okay. But many people could go there and access to the, to the ceremonies from outside.
Are you suggesting then that the admitted were presented with a 3D visual representation of creation, which they moved backwards through? No. For example, they're moving through the three windows of creation. So the question is then, is Lake Titicaca itself represented at that site? Is is there a representation of the lake to connect the island of the sun visually with Machu Picchu? A well or... I don't know if, if there is some place which can be... Uh, like the rock, maybe the image of the rock of the sun. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But uh, what I know is this, this direction, which is the direction from southeast to the northeast, was fundamental to the Incas because it was, in a sense, the direction of the Milky Way. Yes. You can see the Milky Way the, uh, as a part of the spirits, but also as a part of water, because they were thinking that water, uh, which comes back to the earth, comes from, from the Milky Way. And this arching of the Milky Way from the southeast to the northwest is sort of celestial image of this part between the eye of the sun and, and Machu Picchu. Mm. Uh, what I would like to say is that the existence of replicas of sacred places is a standard thing. Uh, for instance, in Italy, we have the so-called Sacri Monti. They are now a UNESCO, UNESCO sites, by the way. And Sacri Monti, what are Sacri Monti? Are hills where you find several chapels. And inside each chapel, you have a station of the uh, Passion of Christ. So what is a Sacri Monti? It is a sort of replica of Via Dolorosa, which is the street in Jerusalem, which is supposed to be the part of Christ going to the Passion. Mm -hmm. And you don't go to Jerusalem. uh, If you can, uh, if if you are a pilgrim and you can go to Jerusalem, it's fine. But uh, if you cannot, you make your pilgrimage to the Sacri Monti or to the house of, uh, of Mary, which is in Loreto, again in Italy, and so on. So the idea of replicating sacred places to have a, a processional path is standard in many religions. What is important is that, uh, and I conclude, is that these places are, in a sense, liminal. Mm. So it's not easy to go there. You must be willing to go there with some effort. Yes, yes. So Machu Picchu, which is uh, three days from Cusco, and you must go uphill, and, and so on. This is quite standard in... Uh, processional paths. So in your perception, Machu Picchu is more of a pilgrimage site where people were exposed to a very liminal experience. Have you found any archaeoastronomical correlations between the island of the sun or the temple there and Machu Picchu? From the archaeoastronomical point of view, uh, the island of the sun has a very clear alignment, not been discovered by me, but I think by Bauer and their partner. Uh, and it's very clear. It, you have this explanate, uh, which is in front of this rock. With, when you see this rock, you think, oh, what was that? But the Incas were conceiving it as the place where the sun was born. Don't ask why, because <laughs> we don't know why. Yes, this rock was associated with Viracocha, the creator god, yeah, yeah. in some creation myths, but also with the birth of the sun and the moon and others. Yeah. And uh, from the winter solstice, you can see the sun uh, rising from a hill when you stay on the plaza. So winter solstice, of course, we are in June. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are quite sure. I mean, I've not been there on the hill, but they say that uh, there are the foundations of two pillars. So the sun was rising, framed inside these two pillars, and we have quite good documentation of the existence of this kind of pillars at the horizon in Cusco. Yes, yes. Because because, uh, chronicles, Spanish chronicles speak about them. So, yes, there is a quite clear alignment to the winter solstice sunrise on the island of the sun. And in Machu Picchu, uh, Machu Picchu, Many things are quite doubtful. For instance, the so-called Intihuatana, that is so liked from the tourist guides, 
it's quite doubtful that it was a solar symbol. Mm. Uh, but uh, there is a general interest from the winter solstice, certainly, both in the planning of the town and in the Torreon. So, yes. You mentioned the work of Brian Bauer and Charles Stanish, who identified a winter solstice alignment on the island of the Sun on Lake Titicaca, um, which was boxed by two pillars. Yeah. Well, Julio, I extended that 65, 295 degree solstice axis to the northwest, and after 937 kilometres, it terminates on the Temple of the Sun at Pachacamac on the west coast, just to the south of Lima arguably the second biggest Inca sacred centre after the Island of the Sun. While the Island of the Sun was located with the creator god Viracocha, Pachacamac, at the other end of the alignment, was the animator of the world or universe. Until this discussion, I had always considered this occurrence as a deliberation, thinking that maybe Pachacamac was located on the extended winter solstice alignment from the Island of the Sun. But this alignment's just too long and it's out with line of sight, just like the 45 degree alignment in Colombia. So you're going to dismiss this as a matter of luck, aren't you? Yes, but as I told you before, they are not alignments because you cannot see. Yes. But let's call them alignments. If you have alignments which are on the parallel Uh or on the meridian, I am a bit more kind in considering them because... I do know the way they could do that. Uh So it is, in principle, possible to follow the parallel. And it is, in principle, possible to follow the meridian on the carpet earth. But when you have 45 degrees, either you see each other or it it, it becomes very, very difficult. You must uh, use, uh, let's say, fires in the night. Uh, direction you must use setting or rising or starts it's very difficult so Machu Picchu now becomes a pilgrimage site which what you suggested wasn't only attended perhaps on the key dates in the calendar by the royalty itself but you think that this was something that chosen people were allowed to participate in to participate yes but uh, I repeat you you can adjust uh, I think many thousands of people in the so-called watchtower uh, explanade, which is outside Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. But you can see what happens very far. It's like, I mean, it's like being the third ring of a football stadium. You can see almost anything, uh, but very, very far. Yes. And uh, we have also proofs that people were coming to Machu Picchu from all the empire. There are, for instance, peoples coming from uh, very far places and so on. Yes. But of course, um, it, it should also be said that the Inca had the uh, mandatory work for the state. So it may be that, that they were workers uh-huh. and, and not pilgrim, pilgrims. I, I have no proofs that they were pilgrims. Five months ago, I wrote a news article on a paper that was published. The paper suggested that the servants to the estate were genetically associated with Argentina, Ecuador, and that the servants had come from far and wide. But I wonder if perhaps those weren't the bones of servants, but they were perhaps the bones of the pilgrims. Maybe. Ecuador and Argentina are certainly possible because they were parts of the empire. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Absolutely. So, Julio, what I'd like to do is thank you so much for the last hour. It's been so, so insightful. Thanks. Thanks. And we broke my plans of doing a formal interview, but I can tell you we did cover 80% of what I was wanting to discuss. So thank you very much. Thanks. You are most welcome, really. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe, drop a five-star review or share it with a friend. And you can get in touch with me through HistoryFuzz.com.